Welcome back to The Big Show, everybody. Uh, I'm really excited about our next guest because uh, I've been friends with Tommy Bowden forever and haven't spoken to him in a long time. And we're getting close to college football. And I was thinking about him the other day. I follow him on social media. and He's always working out and having a great time with his family. And, and now he joins us on the show. Tommy, first off, great to see you. Uh, I mean, yeah. you look fantastic. You haven't aged. What's going on? Other than my gray hair. You know, <laughs> that's the only thing I've aged. But uh, I work out a lot. But... Uh, like I said, it's been a while since I've seen you when I coached Alabama and Auburn, but hadn't been back to Birmingham in a while. But uh, those were good times. Yeah. Hey, July 10th. Am I wrong? Your birthday's coming up? July 10th coming up. I'll be coming back from Cancun, Mexico with my with my family on vacation. Is that is that a milestone birthday, Tommy? Or should I mention it or no? <laughs> Yeah, I think, uh, it's 70. I'm glad I'm having 70. You know? so I've, I've, unfortunately, I've done some eulogies for, for friends of mine that didn't make it. So 70, I'll be happy with 70 and be more happy with 71. There you go. Um, you know, as long as I've known you, and especially when I was doing Clemson games there when you were the head coach, and I was coming up with Coach Ingram, by the way, we were doing those crazy games, you would always be running in the middle of the day, the heat of the day. And... <laughs> It always amazed me, but you did that for years, and you're still exercising, all right? Yeah, really. I, re I got in, into jogging about 1978 and did it for a long time. I, I think I calculated where I run about 45,000 miles and 22,000 around the earth, so I've done that twice. But wow. as I got older, my knees kind of gave out. So uh, when I used to jog, I'd look at them walkers and say, man, that doesn't count. Got to look at that guy walking. And now I'm one of those. <laughs> I'm a walker. No. <laughs> well, good. A walker without a walker. That's good. Uh, keep go. it going. Keep on trucking, Tommy. Hey, uh, you know, I saw a promo yesterday, uh, ESPN, uh, eight more Saturdays in col until college game day in Dublin, Ireland, August 24th, FSU against Georgia Tech. I mean, Tommy, it's, it's here before you know it. I mean, it's pretty, pretty amazing how quickly college football ends and then starts right back up. Well, it really does, you know, and the thing, of course, that keeps college football alive during the summer it used to be a dead period, you know, after all the spring games. But now with this transfer portal and NIL mm. and all that's happening, it just it's, it seems like college football from a media standpoint stays active all year round now where it used to be a little bit of a dead period. So the kickoff gets here sooner than you think because it doesn't seem like you ever stop talking about it. Now, uh, especially with all the stuff you just mentioned. Hey, before we get into that NIL and your thoughts, et cetera, you think your dad would have loved to have gone over to Ireland and played a football game? He would have loved to go. He would have taken his clubs, I promise you that, and found, <laughs> found some way to play. I don't think he ever played in Ireland as much as he loved golf. But, uh, yeah, he would have liked He He loved travel. He's been, he's been to Europe a bunch. He was a World War II buff. But getting to different parts of the country internationally, him and my, my mother did a lot of traveling. So he, he would have enjoyed that trip. Yeah, I remember Ricky Davis, uh, his longtime uh, friend, lawyer, agent. I think they went over to Normandy together, if I remember Ricky telling me the story. That was special for your dad when he went over to, to, uh, to see all that went on there. It really was. You know, in fact, I happened to go with him on one of the trips where I think it was the 70th anniversary, maybe 75th of D-Day. Wow. You know, we went over to Bastogne and uh, Germany and stayed there for about 10 or 11 days. Ricky went with us, but I went with my father. They were shooting a documentary, and they knew of his fondness and uh, being a World War II history buff. But uh, it, was, it was a great trip. Yeah, man, I love your dad like so many people. Uh, and i got to ask you about your mom. Uh, you posted a picture the other day. You took uh, uh, Mrs. Bowden out to lunch. Boy, she's doing great, isn't she? Yeah, she really is. She'll be 92 in September. We're going to wow. uh, celebrate her birthday in, in Tallahassee. I was there just a couple of weeks ago. But uh, she uh, she lasted a lot longer than my father because she chased us four boys around and beat us for so many years. <laughs> she, was just a, she was just a little bit stronger than my father. So. <laughs> he died at 91, and she'll be 92 in September. Yeah, Mrs. Bowden, what, what a great lady. And I remember, Tommy, 99, if I, my memory serves me, the first Bowden Bowl, when you and your dad were the first father-son head coaches to ever go against each other. And she had that sweater or sweatshirt. It was half FSU, half Clemson. She didn't know who to root for. <laughs> no, well, she, she, she knew after that game she better stick with her husband because he paid the bills. But, but that sweatshirt you talk about that ESPN got a shot of it, uh, I, I was up at Clemson. Uh, Dabo flew me up to Clemson when they honored my father the year after he passed away, and he presented that sweatshirt to me. He, somehow he saw it. My mother gave it away to be auctioned. It was auctioned, and he, uh, he either purchased it or somebody did, but 
he presented that to me in a nice frame, and I and I have it now in my in my house. So uh, a lot of fond memories. But you're right, 1999, the first wow. Bowden Bowl. And you now you finally beat him in 03, I think, right? Isn't that I right? I think 03 was my first year. It's amazing because I, the the ver first year he won the national championship, and I had him 14 to three at halftime. Lost oh, wow. 17 to 14. He killed me the next few years. And then uh, <laughs> we ended up winning uh, four out of the last five, and then he won. We played nine, he won five, and I won four. So I, I let him get one up on me. Do you remember what he said to you after the game as you guys shook hands in 03 when you finally beat him? Oh, yeah. He said, you better go recruit me. <laughs> and, and, <laughs> and we did. You know, as soon as our talent, he had great talent. Of course, they did a great job of coaching great talent. That's why he won so many games. But we went back and, and, and got, you know, you have to, re recruiting is the lifeblood of that profession. So we, we increased our talent level and, and, and finally caught up with him and surpassed him the last few years. But it, it took a few years to catch him. Wow. All right, hey, Tommy, what, what is your feeling about today's game, though? I mean, you mentioned the transfer portal, NIL. I mean, all this craziness is happening now. The NCAA settled out of court with a recent lawsuit. So athletes in all sports are going to get compensated. Um, I mean, and, and this is one of these broad questions, and I, I don't expect a long answer, but uh, I mean, are you glad you're out of it now? Is, it, is the game in, in trouble? What, what are your thoughts about all that's this chaos is happening now, and especially college football. I think last year was the best indicator about how much how coaches feel about it. When Chip Kelly left the head coaching job at UCLA to to go to go to uh, Ohio State, Ohio State, and then you got the head coach of Boston College, a life ambition and dream goes to be a coordinator in the NFL. The head coach of Georgia State goes to be the tight end coach at uh, at uh, South Carolina, and then South Alabama's head coach. Goes to Alabama be coordinator, and Buffalo's head coach goes to Alabama be coordinator. So <laughs> I think that's the indication of how coaches feel about it. One quick solution: I think you got to have a co-commissioners. We'll get this thing squared away in one year. Let Nick Saban and Charles Barkley be co-commissioners. <laughs> both bring a perspective, uniqueness, uh, angle to the to the college football and what's needed. And the college game is from the professional aspect, NIL. So. Let Charles Barkley and Nick Saban be co-coordinators, co-commissioners, and they'll have it cleared up in two years. <laughs> well, obviously, Coach Saban will be the football guy and Charles will be the basketball guy, but I think Charles would somehow try to uh, uh, have commentary on both sports and all sports. No, oh, yeah. Well, he brings a common, let's say, a common sense approach uh, to, to, to the problem, but uh, he, he would bring a unique perspective, no doubt, and he'd have some colorful comments. <laughs> do, you, do you miss it, Tommy? I mean, you've been out of it now for a while. And, and listen, for those of you listening now and watching, I mean, Tommy it was not only a great head coach at Clemson and Tulane where they were 12-0 and one season, uh, but he was an assistant coach, Tommy. I was looking it up. I, I had no idea. I mean, you were an assistant like at eight or nine different schools. Do, do you miss it, Tommy? You know, I, I, I really don't. I enjoy I coached 32 years. I was very fortunate, Doug. You know, born in Birmingham, heaven – would be to coach at Alabama or to coach at Auburn. You usually pick one or two. <laughs> I got to coach at both uh, both of them. Right. And a great experience as both of them as head coach and had some success. And I'd always had in the back of my mind mid-50s to get out. Uh, I did TV for eight or nine years. I still do a lot of Christian speaking. I really enjoy that. And I wanted to do that while I was healthy enough and could maybe uh, make an, uh, uh, be a factor in, in that aspect of my life and from a Christian perspective. So uh, uh, I enjoyed it. Uh, might have stayed in a few more years had that athletic director uh, come and made the decision for him for me at six in the morning. Uh, had he had he not made it, but I think God gives you clarity. And uh, that morning he made it really clear that I need, need to be doing something else when the AD came in. But I would have gotten out probably a few more years. I just signed a seven-year contract. My back of my mind, I say I'll coach a couple more till mid fifties and, and get out. So uh, I enjoy what I was doing. I enjoyed it while I did it, but. Man, it has taken such a such a bad direction. I would have I would have been looking to get out. Well, the relationships with the players obviously is a big deal for you guys who are lifers. I mean, you played at West Virginia, you coached, assistant, head coach for a long time. Uh, I mean, look at me. That that's what it's all about, right? And I think that's what your dad enjoyed the relationships with the players, right? Yeah, and then seeing them as you get older. 
Right. You know, I went went back to the 25th reunion at Tulane for that undefeated season. Hadn't been back since. Those guys were in their 40s. They showed up with their wives, their children, uh, gray hair. I couldn't believe it. And I went up to speak at a Christian fundraiser up in North Carolina, and a wide receiver that I had signed at Duke and coached at Duke was, gosh, he was must have been 50 some years old or a fit, wow. late 50s. Was a judge up in the area. Graduated from Duke. Went to law school. So th- those things are really rewarding, but you don't experience them until you, after you get out of the profession for a while, and then you, you hope uh, to, to see the, the impact that you made, and hopefully it was a positive impact. But those relationships that you just mentioned, and they're, they're, and they're fun as you're coaching. You're, you're seeing a freshman mature and grow into young adulthood and to, to manhood from 17 to 22. That's, that's rewarding too, but I think more so as you see uh, what they become later on in life. Tell me this now, I mean, and, and as you've embarked on this this almost second career where you go out and, and you speak on behalf of the Fellowship of Christian Athletes and uh, you speak on your own behalf because Christianity is important to you, um, do you find young people today are more in tune than they were 10, 20 years ago? Or is it about the same and, and now maybe you just get more publicity because of social media or something like that? It's a little more difficult because of what you just said, uh, social media. There's no doubt there's some positive aspects in social media, especially look from the Christian perspective on the ability to reach people in, in places which you could never do. But it also, when you look at the other perspective, the negative aspects and the, and the let's just say, quote unquote, sinful aspects of, of mm-hmm. today's culture and the way today's culture, it makes it more prominent, it makes it more acceptive. Uh, social media does so to a certain extent when you go out speaking and I speak in different types of environment whether it be uh, Christian faith-based Christian cancer research which I did the other day or father-son banquets or church services which I have coming up or whatever uh, it's it surely is more difficult nowadays and I think because of some of the issues and difficulties that social media the, 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 the acceptance factor and then politically if you look the way we're divided and, and the way our culture is and in and, and 2024. So there, there are tremendous challenges. And I think moral clarity, Doug, uh, moral clarity is needed now more day and now more than, than ever. And it just seems like the, the, the American family is a little more dysfunctional. Young people aren't going to church. So the, the job of coaches and the job of maybe some Christian speakers is a little more uh, uh, important than it was in the years past. You know, Tommy, as I still do some games here and there uh, on the college landscape, um, FCA directors at virtually every school. I mean, every head coach, it's important to have somebody on that platform because as I'm told, and I, I saw it when you were coaching and even, even today, uh, a lot of these young people, they need somebody to talk to and they're comfortable talking to people who talk about religion. Uh, I, don't, I don't know. I think, I think it's still very important today. I mean, I see it when I go to these college campuses and in these complexes, whether it's football, basketball, or whatever. Well, there's no doubt. Psychologists say the most influential parent is a same-sex parent. And unfortunately, in today's society, the father, the 40 years I recruited, the more I recruited, the less and less I saw the fathers. And mm-hmm. a lot of times, the high school coach is the father, is, is the male image. And, uh, and then you throw in the, the, the Christian perspective that, uh, that he has the ability to do. FCA, Doug, has found a way uh, to get around the ACLU rules and get in the public school system. It's done it pretty much nationally and internationally, and there's no doubt it's needed, especially if you look at all the issues that, are, that let's say, the culture uh, brings nowadays. So some moral clarity, it's not, and unfortunately it's not coming from churches and parents, uh, the coaches and, and, and others have a tremendous opportunity to influence them in a, in a society where it's, it's uh, greatly needed. You know, it's interesting, Tommy, you go back to the Tim Tebow era, and obviously he wore the John 316 uh, uh, stickers underneath his eyes and, and got a lot of publicity, still uh, gets a lot of publicity, and he took a lot of criticism back then. But I see an evolution in today's athlete. I see more and more young people, when they score a touchdown or score a basket, uh, you know, they celebrate with maybe a, a prayer, a look to the sky, a post-game interview where they credit uh, their Lord and Savior. I mean, I, I'm seeing it more, Tommy. Am, am I right? Or is it just, I mean, it seems like people are now are accepting it more when I thought they were pretty tough on Tim Tebow back in the day. 
Oh, I think they were, but again, like you said, in social media, I think has something to do with it. But mm. it seems like athletes are a little more bold, uh, right. and even coaches. I think just recently, I think the head coach of the Boston Celtics in his press conference acknowledged, yes. I think some faith-based aspect of his life. And then you see just in the cultures taking a swing. What's happened in Louisiana with the Ten Commandments possibly going to schools? What's happened in Oklahoma with the Bible being taught, not from a Christian perspective, but from just a, a book that was important in American history? Going back to the last uh, year's Supreme Court uh, verdicts on abortion and, 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 and the guy that uh, su sued the, the, uh, the government on uh, getting off on Sunday for religious reasons. I think sometimes, and you know, it's, it's, it's a political, definitely, uh, it, yeah. Difficult political culture nowadays, but I do. So when you look at the whole thing, you, you see, hey, we might be swinging, making a swing back towards some some moral clarity in our in our country. Yeah, well, we need it. There's no question about it. And I just, I really believe. And I'm on the PGA tour a lot, and vast majority of these young golfers, I mean, they they have somebody, they have a clergyman that they speak to on the PGA tour that travels week in and week out. So I, I think sports plays a role. Tommy, I really do. I, I think some people would, would say that's ridiculous. Sports isn't a key in component or ingredient in young people's lives, but I, I think it is. And I think what you're doing and what a lot of people are doing, making a difference. I mean, you, you got you to gotta kind of tap away at it, right? You kind of have to keep working at it. Oh, it's like anything else in life. You know, it's nothing. You don't, you don't reach the level of success or the standard of excellency in your first year of doing anything, whether it be athletics or your professional life or your marriage or anything. You obviously, you get, better, you get better with time. And Christianity is the same way. And I think the more that we have athletes and politicians or just lay people uh, take a strong stand, uh, I think there's a better chance for it to be a little more influential in our society. But I, I think it's needed, but I kind of, I kind of, I got a dog in the hunt. That's what I believe in the Christian <laughs> big part, part of my life. My father was like that. My mother was like that. We were raised in that environment. Uh, so uh, I think it's important and it looks like it's, 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 we're, a, we're in a place in this country where we, we, we might be heading down one path or the other and hopefully it'll be the one where God plays an important part. Well said. I appreciate that. Uh, hey, tell me this. Getting back to your dad. Uh, and again, I, th I thought the world of your dad. Um, and I always tell people, and it's interesting, as you talk recruiting, and Nick Saban, obviously, up until he retired and over the last 15 years, was the best recruiter in the country, as evidenced by the, the kids that he signed. But your dad, back in the day, I, w I was always told this, and Coach Ingram always told that he was the best closer there was. <laughs> he could go into a living room and talk to whoever and close the deal better than anybody else. Did, I'm sure you have a story about that, right? Or do you agree with that? Well, yeah, I did because I had to recruit against him. But I also <laughs> right. was, was fortunate as a young coach to, to go be with him when he went in the home. So I knew what he was saying. You know, I think Nick, one of the things that make Nick Saban so great uh, among uh, one of the things that he had, a, he had a, a tie to the NFL. All every seventeen-year-old wants to go to the NFL. So as he recruited a guy, he could really put something on the table which appealed to them. Uh, the other thing I think with my father, I think, had another strong uh, appeal, and that was his ability to to to, to win the mother. <laughs> you hmm. know, a lot of single-parent homes. Uh, he had six, six children. He had nineteen grandchildren, about twelve great-grandchildren. When he went into a home and uh, the uh, adult has to sign the paper, and a lot of times it was the mother, I think that attachment that uh, he projected from a family aspect, from a fatherly image to creating a family environment, it was evident in his life and what he did as a father, what he did as a husband, and then I think he implemented that in his recruiting style, but uh, two maybe different approaches uh, from two very successful head coaches, but I think my father more than anything would attack that mother so when I went into a home, I, that's the first thing I went after was, was the mother because uh, they, they usually have to sign the paper, a lot of single parent homes. But I knew that was how, that was the avenue that my father was mostly going to attack. Wow, that's great stuff. You know, I, I saw your brother Terry a few months back at the Nick Saban Awards in Birmingham and your father was honored. Um, and it was great to see. I hadn't seen Terry in forever. Uh, but Mickey Andrews was there, his longtime defensive coordinator. And Mickey told that great story. You know, he was in the USFL with Arizona, and your dad was looking for a defensive coordinator. And M Mickey was looking for a college job. And he said, as he goes to Tallahassee, your dad said, let's just meet at the local McDonald's. 
because <laughs> he said, your dad loved McDonald's. And Mickey said, I've never had an interview at a McDonald's, but they met. And obviously the rest was history. But as, as your dad told Mickey Andrews, listen, I don't want anything complicated. I just want to run one defense. I want you to run it better than anybody else. We'll have the best athletes running it. And that's all you got to do. And wow, what a great marriage that was. What a great story, uh, Tommy. I, yeah. I love that story. Dad, Dad was really a pretty simple guy. He believed yeah. he was never talked in blocking and tackling. And his thing was go sign great athletes. Don't confuse them. Uh, his right. philosophy on defense, he who hesitates is lost. Don't confuse <laughs> them. Get, get them going and then just let them, let them play and let their athleticism take off, you know, put, put them in the right direction. So I can see a lot of validity in that story, just personally knowing his philosophy, being with him, recruiting, listening to him in staff meetings. Hey, d don't confuse them. Let's, we'll, get, we'll get great athletes. Let's, don't, don't make them hesitate. Yeah, that was good stuff. Uh, and, and Mickey Andrews, another gentleman who uh, I have a great deal of respect for. And it was great to see him. Hadn't seen him in many years. Uh -huh. Hey, Tommy, tell me this as we look ahead to the future. Uh, and I know you you do some work with the ACC network, et cetera. Um, I mean, is is Florida State and Clemson? I mean, it, it appears now that they've already they're going to court to get out of this ACC agreement. I mean, it appears their their future is short lived in the ACC. Agree or disagree? Well, you know, it's going to be interesting because it's going to involve a lot of money, and money's an issue right now with uh, mm. gender equity and Olympic sports and equality, and, and having to come up with some NIL money. But, uh, you know, as I talk to some administrators in, in the ACC, when a lot of the stars start floating around about Clemson and Florida State, and I said, I said, you know, we better be careful. Do, do they want them? Does the SEC want them? Does the Big Ten want them? And obviously, the Big Ten would like a Florida connection. They don't have a Florida connection. But the SEC, from what I just talked to some administrators, the team they want is North Carolina. They don't have, an imp uh, they don't have a footprint in North Carolina. Clemson, they got South Carolina and Clemson. Uh, they have, a, a SEC has a Florida footprint. They don't have a footprint in North Carolina. So I think there's a lot still happening, but uh, there's always some surprises. So while right now Clemson and Florida State are the names in the ACC, wouldn't surprise me to see all of a sudden North Carolina jumps in the SEC. And now the SEC has a footprint in another state that they would love to get into. Well, I mean, the Southeastern Conference, the interesting thing about the SEC is that every state touches where you have a school, uh, whereas the Big Ten now, they're somewhat fragmented with the California schools. And if they should jump down and get a Florida school, my goodness, the Big Ten would have kind of a wild geographic range there. <laughs> you know, it'd be crazy. Yeah, it really would. But, you know, and, and there's probably it might be some merit to that strategy because right now the Big Ten and the SEC has created some separation. It doesn't look like it's going to slow down. It looks like they're accelerating the separation. And I will see if this uh, intersectional uh, ge geographical decisions uh, pay off for them. But uh, they've really made some good decisions in the past, and they've been on the forefront. If there's, if there's two teams from the administration standpoint that have been, you know, kind of visionary, it would be the SEC and the Big Ten. And SEC has got a nice strategy. It's worked well for them. Uh, let all the footprints touch. But the Big Ten's done pretty well, and uh, their footprint might be a little bit bigger and might, be, uh, might start getting a little uh, more national flavor as opposed to a regional flavor like the SEC. Hey, Tommy, before I let you go, and I remember working games with uh, uh, the late, great Mal Moore years ago. Coach Moore, you knew him very well. Mm -hmm. And when we would do games, he would tell me, listen, by personnel groupings and formation, he could pretty much tell what the other offense was going to do. He said, to be honest – maybe 85% of the time. And I was like, really? And I was like, why don't you say that on TV? He's like, because that wouldn't be fair to the opposing team. And, you know, that's Coach Moore, right? Uh, nowadays, if an uh, analyst could do that, you know, he'd be touted as the best. But I would think, Tommy, you could probably do the same thing. As, as much as you know about football, when, when an offense runs out of the field now, you pretty much know what they're going to run, don't you? Uh, you know, you have to be really be about self-scouting yourself is really, really important. And uh, I think what Hootie said was very accurate. Of course, at that time, you, you, they weren't nearly as complex as they are now. It's a, lot <laughs> right. more, it's a lot more difficult by just having certain groupings because people self-scout themselves. That's one thing I learned from my father, you know, that uh, he was so simple in formations that he had to 
develop, uh, t he, he developed tendencies. He had to make sure he self-scouted himself to not to mm. develop tendencies and because the formations were so, were so, uh, fundam fundamental, so elementary, I should say. Now it's, 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 you're up into the college level classes in formations and tendencies, motions and, and disguises offensively and defensively. So it's changed. It's gotten a little bit harder. Uh, but, uh, again, I've done it for so long as far as, uh, uh, doing self scout that I can see tendencies by formation, by personnel groupings, by personnel that they have in, and even by down distance and hash mark, you can start and field position. You know, you can you can draw some some maybe some some ideas on what they're going to do. Yeah, I love that. Uh, man, I could talk football with you all day. Well, <laughs> August tw August twenty fourth will be here before you know it. FSU and Georgia Tech and Ireland, and I know you got a family vacation coming up and a big birthday and. And Tommy, it's great to catch up. It's great to see you, my friend. Uh, man, I hope I hope all keeps going well for you. You're doing some fantastic stuff. Hey, thank you, Doug. Appreciate. It. Have a good summer, and can't wait for the kickoff. Yeah, man. Enjoy Cancun. <laughs> I will. Hurricanes <laughs> coming, but it'll be missed. <laughs> Bye, Tommy.